Hello, and welcome to the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. My name is Claudia Rizzini. I'm the Executive Director of the Fellowship Program. The Radcliffe Institute brings together students, scholars, and practitioners from across disciplines and professions to create and share transformative ideas. You can participate in these laboratory of ideas by attending public programs such as this one, visiting virtual exhibitions, or pursuing the special collection held at the Schlesinger Library. To learn more about Radcliffe, please feel free to sign up to receive information on news and events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. We'll begin the program with a presentation by Professor Michael Honey. After the presentation, the speaker will respond to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time throughout the program. We ask that you keep your questions brief to allow us to address as many as possible in the time that we have together. It is my pleasure to introduce Michael Honey. He is the Fred and Dorothy Haley Professor of Humanities at the University of Washington, Tacoma. As a young man in 1970, Michael Honey was roused from sleep by, the FBI, by FBI agents in Louisville, Kentucky. He and his wife were arrested in jail. Their crime, being activists for the Southern Conference Educational Fund. They would go on to work with the Black Liberation Fighters and Students, anti-war and feminist activists across several Southern states. During these tumultuous, tumultuous times in American history, they specifically worked with many other individuals and groups to organize the Southern Committee to free Angela Davis and all political prisoners. After several years of activism, Honey studied history in graduate school at Howard and Northern Illinois University, and his activism continued to shape his interest and work as an academic. His first monograph, Southern Labor and Black Civil Rights, Organizing Memphis Workers, is a study of 20th century Black labor organizing in, Jim Crow, in the Jim Crow South. Honey's book, Going Down Jericho Road, lays out a history of Dr. King's last campaign for economic justice in Memphis and was awarded the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award. While doing research in the archives at the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta, Honey came upon a previously unpublished cache of speeches that Dr. King gave to labor unions and workers. These addresses were first published in Honey's compilation, All Labor Has Dignity, which focuses on Dr. King's outreach to unions and workers. These works open up the links between labor and civil rights history and changed our understanding of Martin Luther King from primarily a civil rights martyr to a labor hero and a sharp critic of America's war and its racial capitalism. Honey's, Honey's oral history, Sharecropper Troubadour on John Hancock's provides a fascinating account of Hancock's life amid the economic exploitation of sharecropping. Hancock's was a key organizer of the Southern Tenant Farmer Union who wrote and sang songs at activist meeting across the South. And this review of his life allows him to address his part in the African-American song tradition. In the New York Review of Books, Professor Annette Gordon-Reed summarized Honey's latest monograph, The Promised Land, Martin Luther King and the Fight for Economic Justice, as a very cogent book that shows that King intending from the intended from the start of his public career to work to end racial discrimination and poverty for all Americans. To the Promised Land details the chronicle of how King would go on to find that racism was firmly rooted in the unions and fighting against this drove himself to exhaustion in his final years. Honey has given interviews and written for the Atlantic, Time Magazine, NPR, The Guardian, The Nation and many other media outlets and he has been awarded fellowship at the National Humanities Center, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, and several others. And now it is my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Professor Michael Honey. 
Thanks to you, Claudia, for that warm introduction. It, that was a wonderful overview. Um, I'm so happy to be part of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies and to share this opportunity to know and work with our amazing Radcliffe Fellows from around the world. Thanks also to my Harvard student research partners, Rhea Modak, Salka Jewett, and Brooke Martin. And special thanks to my University of Washington Tacoma, Mary Gates research partner, Casey Reynolds Wagner, who helped me put this presentation together and who is running the slides. Martin Luther King gave us his last speech in Memphis the night before he was assassinated on April 4th, 1968, saying, I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. So what was King's promised land? He wanted to take us from the first stage of the freedom movement for civil and voting rights to a second stage to end racism, poverty, and war. His Poor People's Campaign for Good Jobs, Housing, Healthcare, and Peace envisioned the promised land as America with economic and social justice. In Memphis in 1968, and for many years before, King demanded union rights for working people. We've been struggling to implement King's vision ever since. Let's listen for a moment to what he told sanitation workers and their allies at a Memphis rally in 1968. If we are going to get equality, if we are going to get adequate wages, we are going to have to struggle for it. Now, you know what? You may have to escalate the struggle a bit. If they keep refusing and they will not recognize the union and will not agree uh, for the check off of the collection of dues, I'll tell you what you ought to do, and you're together here enough to do it. In a few days, you ought to get together and just have a general wet stockage in the city of Memphis. My work as a scholar, as Claudia told you, has been to help open previously missing links between labor and civil rights history by researching black and white workers organizing in the South from the 1930s onward. With an array of movement historians, I have also helped to revise our understanding of Dr. King from a too simple image of him as a quote, civil rights leader to his full stature as a nonviolence human rights and social justice advocate. And also as a strong union supporter and sharp critic of America's wars and its racial capitalism. King had great hopes for our future, but he also left behind a warning published after his death in an essay that he wrote for Look Magazine. He warned that systemic racism could destroy American democracy and take us to an American form of fascism. In 1970, President Richard Nixon's campaign manager and Attorney General John Mitchell confirmed this possibility by saying, we're going to take America so far to the right, you won't recognize it. Our current Republican administration has shown us just what he meant. Ibram X. Kendi says we are now experiencing a racial pandemic inside a viral pandemic. Movement activist and nonviolence prophet James Lawson tells us that in these fraught times, we must build a massive nonviolent direct action movement such as the world has never seen before. Now we have one. The Washington Post documented 7,305 Black Lives Matter events in every town and city in all 50 states and the District of Columbia and worldwide involving millions, including 21 demonstrations in my hometown of Tacoma, Washington. Despite what the Trump administration says, these were overwhelmingly peaceful. Southern writer William Faulkner famously wrote, the past is not dead, it's not even past. Our lives today depend on if we remember or understand history. The current resident of the White House counts on us not knowing and not understanding. The Republicans now put a Supreme Court justice on the bench to interpret the law based on the quote, original constitution of 1787. Let me remind you that would be before the freedom amendments, 13th, 14th and 15th and 19th, giving people equality and voting rights before the law, it would take us back to a time when 4 million people were slaves and black people were counted in the census as three fifths of a person for purposes 
of representation. This is a totally backward view of constitutional liberty. Everyone talks about freedom, Republicans most of all, but historian Eric Foner asks us, freedom for who to do what? Freedom is not a static thing. It evolves based on our movements to expand it, which makes the Constitution not the same document as the original one enacted in 1787. So in the face of looming danger today, we must continue to fight and ask what is past and what is present in the struggle to be free. I tell students our fate depends on those who know what's going on and those who don't. Understanding history is key to that. Uh, I'm asking those questions myself in a new way, guided by the Women's Liberation Movement slogan, the personal is political. I want to remember how history felt as well as what happened. And seen through my own eyes as one of the participants of the freedom and anti-war movements of the 1960s and 1970s. I know that memory itself is not history. So I tell the story through historical research and documents as any historian would, oral histories, and of course, what other historians have written, as well as my own diaries and my own memories. In this time of viral and racist pandemics when our very lives are at stake every day, I feel the urgent need to reconsider history in this more personal way. I'm just beginning this project, They Never Can Jail Us All, which by the way, is uh, a line from a civil rights song uh, aimed at Governor Wallace, You Never Can Jail Us All, who was trying to enforce segregation at, at the schoolhouse door. Um, I'm just beginning this project, so I can only give you a little sketch of what history it contains, but I'll give you a, a little overview. Um, first of all, researching my family history, I learned that every generation of men before me went to war. My great-great-grandfather, a first-generation English, English immigrant named Thomas Shepard, enlisted at age 44 to fight the Confederacy. He was captured at the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863 and ended up in the horrific Andersonville Confederate concentration camp as a prisoner of war. You see it here. It was basically out in an open field with no drainage and uh, no, no clean drinking water, no nothing. Um, some 45,000 Union men passed through Andersonville's gates of hell. Some 13,000 of them died. Thomas Shepard survived, and in his service to the Union, he helped to destroy American slavery. My grandfather, Honey, uh, was drafted and sent to Siberia as a soldier in the government's vain effort to overthrow the Bolshevik Revolution after World War I. This was a dishonorable war in which he ended up facing peasants armed with pitchforks. It was a memory that always haunted him. Then the Honey's last war hero was my father, Keith Honey, who enlisted in the Navy after Pearl Harbor attacks to fight in America's so-called good war against fascism and imperialism. My father questioned whether there ever has been a good war. Um, my father, Keith, was the first and maybe the only person in his extended family to get college education. He married Betty Minor in Detroit during the war on July 19th, 1943. They barely escaped town before the horrific uh, white race riot broke out the next day in which 43 people died. There's a long story to tell about racism and labor in Detroit. My mother, Betty, went through high school and became a homemaker, and she was an excellent writer who got increasingly involved in political activism. We sort of evolved our activism, she and I, together throughout the 1960s. She was one of the numerous strong women who made my life possible. My father told me that life is what you make of it, but that it's also about luck. I count myself incredibly lucky to always have had the support of my parents and my siblings. Not everyone has that. With my sister, Maureen and Charles, we lived a happy life. You see Maureen here in the lead, <laughs> followed by myself and then my brother, which is how, how it has always been and still remains. Um, we look like clueless kids coming out of the TV show, Ozzy and Harriet. However, we were not that. Uh, my younger brother, Charles, became a not notable journalist and editor in Grand Rapids. My older sister, Maureen, became a noted scholar of popular culture and women's literature and freedom struggles. 
teaching at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. We all became writers. Our family became increasingly radicalized in the 1960s. We read two newspapers a day, weekly journals, and watched the Black freedom struggle and the Vietnam War as they unfolded on television. The civil rights movement especially inspired us and woke us up. And we see here a couple of pictures from that time period. The Birmingham campaign in 63, the Selma campaign in 65, you see John Lewis being beaten to the ground there. And more on the Selma campaign, which spread across the country. Uh, the Meredith March Against Fear down in Mississippi, Stokely Carmichael and other people. And then uh, Detroit. Uh, Detroit had a big influence on us because we went there often. Uh, both sets of grandparents lived there. Uh, my parents grew up there. They came from all white districts in Detroit where racism was a constant refrain, but I never heard a word of racism from them. They grew up in Catholic and Christian science households to become Unitarians who followed King and his fundamentally American values of equal rights for every person. Like King, we were strongly pro-union in a state where Walter Ruther and the United Auto Workers had a huge influence. This march in 1963 uh, preceded the March on Washington where King gave his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, he gave that same speech here in downtown Detroit with uh, several hundred thousand people. If you read and watched the news constantly, as I did, the freedom movement and the war were pervasive. I adopted an anti-racism and peace agenda in a personal way through the power of music. And this is a little aside, I guess. Uh, at this age, uh, I started playing guitar. Uh, I, I listened to Pete Seeger and other folk, so-called folk singers. Uh, I formed a singing group in high school that played at the Lowell Showboat and other events. Um, we, we were actually pretty good. Uh, Mike McNeely, shown on the right with the guitar and me on the left with the guitar, uh, played, played guitar until our fingers bled. We sang our hearts out and the rest of the time we played football. Um, for the rest of my life, I continued to partner up with some of my idols in the freedom movement. Singers like Pete Seeger, who became a close friend of mine, Betty Mae Fikes, who I've sung with many times, uh, King's civil rights minstrel Jimmy Collier, wonderful man who uh, I still am friends with, uh, and labor, labor and gospel singers in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Pat Wright and the Total Experience Gospel Choir and the DC Labor Chorus. So I was privileged to um, link into this music at an early age, and I continued doing it throughout my life. So Casey, if you go back to that picture for a minute. This is uh, with some activists when I lived in Washington, D.C., in front of the uh, South African embassy. And you might remember constant protests there to try to um, overthrow apartheid, which finally did happen. So this picture of us singing to a crowd of pickets took place just before they arrested us and threw us in jail. Um, Later, I was privileged to rediscover and write about and play music with John Hancock of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, who Claudia mentioned. He was one of the great singer songwriters of the 1930s and more, more importantly, he was a, a union organizer. Um, and protest music then became a lifetime thing for me. And uh, I was especially uh, privileged to meet and play music with John and to, um, do oral histories with him and, and write a book about him eventually, which uh, the preface to it is by Pete Seeger. As a young person through music and then through writing and organizing, anti-racism became my identity politics. I thought being anti-racist is not about guilt, it's about our own self-interest in trying to create the world we want to live in. As Ibram X. Kendi says in How to Be an Anti-Racist, quote, every single person actually has the power to protest racist and anti-racist policies to advance them or in some small way to stall them. Which way we go is up to us. The power for change, he says, comes through, quote, the power of people in groups and individually. When I graduated from high school in 1965, I was an all-county halfback playing football. That was my preoccupation. But I was also 
a pretty serious student, probably too serious. Uh, this is my class president picture. Um, I went to Oakland University, a state school near Detroit, and there I became a student journalist. Uh, I then became an activist in Students for a Democratic Society, a key group for 1960s organizing. And in 1967, I traveled with students and faculty to Hong Kong for a semester to learn about Asia. Um, our learned professor, Henry Rosemont, changed our view of the world. He became my mentor for the rest of my life and his life. I came back from there with this beard and long hair. I didn't look like I looked in high school anymore. Um, and study abroad deepened my anti-war and anti-imperialist consciousness. While I was in college, living near Detroit, I watched what King called the triple evils of racism, poverty, and militarism unfold during the epical 1967 Detroit uprising of poor black people. Poverty and structural racism formed the backdrop and blatant police brutality set off the revolt. In the De Detroit uprising, uh, 43 people died, almost all of them black, killed by police and National Guard occupying the city. Detroit provided a powerful profile of uprisings everywhere. They happened in every city from 1964 to 1970. Um, I became the editor of the Oakland University Observer, our campus newspaper. You can see a few of our concerns here. I've made a few clips of different newspapers. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our time was spent eulogizing uh, our leaders who were being shot down right and left. Um, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, but that's just the beginning. So many others who, who were killed during that time period. Uh, we joined a raft of other people editing radical underground newspapers, of which there were about 600. Our newspaper was overground because it was funded by students, but we also considered ourselves underground. Uh, we carried Liberation News Service and other movement um, services, and uh, our anti-racist and anti-war politics permeated the, the uh, newspaper so much so that after I left college, the students defunded the newspaper. They, most of the students were quite apolitical um, compared to us in SDS. Uh, we also did such a good job that the FBI started a file on me uh, in my sophomore year for organizing a sit-in and a fast against the Vietnam War in that FBI file, followed me around for many years. Uh, we continued to campaign against a fruitless and criminal war that killed 3 million Vietnamese and nearly 60,000 American soldiers with 500,000 of them stationed there in 1968. According to scholar Kath Catherine Ballou, the atrocities of the Vietnam War sp spawned some of the private military gangs that are now terrifying my home state of Michigan. So in 1959, I graduated from college and became the first in my family to say no to war. I went before my draft board to plead my case for conscientious objector status and my war veteran father and my war veteran professor Henry Rosemont were right there with me. Instead of being sentenced to five years in prison for refusing to go, go to war, which was what I was expecting, uh, I received conscientious objector status. Um, at this time, Martha Allen and I had become a team. We helped to run the newspaper together. We went to demonstrations together. We did pretty much everything together. Um, she and I and my sister Maureen and her, her uh, friend John Mock and many others uh, helped to organize the anti-war moratorium in Lansing, Michigan. We wrote and published uh, 50,000 copies of an anti-war newspaper distributed strictly by hand. There was no internet <laughs> distribution. I can't believe even now that we did that. Um, from Lansing, we went to Washington, D.C. on November 15th, 1969. For, and here I saw for the first time the power of a mass movement and mass singing led by Pete Seeger. Here's a little clip of that. On November 15th, 1969, half a million citizens turned out against the war in Washington again. This time, buses provided an impenetrable wall around the White House. President Nixon claimed he was too busy watching football on television to pay attention. But he did suggest that army helicopters might be used to blow out the marchers' candles. 
hundreds of thousands of others demonstrated in San Francisco and New York. So the first part of my project, uh, which I pretty much completed now, is about sort of coming of age in the movement in the 1960s and how uh, the issues of racism, poverty, and war sort of shape my ideas and my my really my personality to some extent and also my goals in life. After the March on Washington that you just saw in 1969, uh, Martha Allen and I got short ha haircuts and we shed our countercultural clothing. As you can see here, we're on the steps of the Southern Conference Educational Fund in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we worked for the legendary anti-racist couple, Ann and Carl Braden, in the Interracial Southern Conference Educational Fund. Carl had gone to prison twice in the 1950s, first for selling a home to a black couple. Imagine this, his home was bombed by whites and then Carl was imprisoned on the ridiculous charge of trying to incite a racial uprising to overthrow the state of Kentucky. Of course, it was thrown out by the courts, but he still spent about nine months in solitary confinement in prison. Carl was imprisoned again for refusing to give names of integrationists to the House on American Activities Committee, which was one of the great, um, HUAC was one of the villains <laughs> of this time. I don't know how, how I can say it, but um, I'll say it in the book. Uh, white authorities in Kentucky hated the Bradens and anyone who worked for them, which of course included us. Our trouble started immediately. We were there only a couple of days uh, and on December 4th, 1969, the FBI and the Chicago police teamed up to assassinate one of the most promising leaders of our time the young Fred Hampton of the Black Panther Party, along with his colleague, Mark Clark. Martha and I drove party members from Louisville to Chairman Fred's funeral in Chicago. Police were everywhere. We barely got out of town. One of our Panther members carried a weapon, so a police encounter would have been deadly. We returned to Louisville to defend the so-called Black Six. Their case was like today's efforts by the White House and Justice Department to blame Black Lives Matter for police and vigilante violence. For organizing protest to Dr. King's death, Kentucky authorities blame six black organizers for what was actually a police riot. For using our First Amendment free press rights to defend the black six within weeks of going south, Martha and I ended up in this jail in Munfordville, Kentucky. The inmates set this fire trap of a jail on fire and almost killed all of us. Jail educated us to how the misnamed criminal justice system really works for poor people, namely it doesn't. Carl Braden taught us that if you survive repression, it gives you an opportunity to raise your issues and fight back. The Chicago Eight did it and we did it too. With support from William Kunstler and others, the Black Six won their case for lack of evidence and uh, Noam Chomsky and others wrote letters, people picketed the jail, uh, got us out of Munfordville, and we won our First Amendment case in the Ninth District Court. If Tr Trump's reactionary judges were on that court then, we would never have won, and we would have been in jail for a long time. With the recent murder of Breonna Taylor, we see that police violence still remains commonplace in Louisville, where we had been living. Um, we campaigned in the 1970s to block no-knock laws in Richard Nixon's proposed federal criminal code but this egregious no-knock law survived at the local level, and now we see the awful results. Meantime, I became the Southern Director of the, Re of the National Committee Against Repressive Legislation, organizing a successful citizen's effort to block Nixon's Senate Bill 1, rewrite of the Federal Criminal Code. Um, and Martha became the organizer of Operation Freedom, providing financial aid to people like Fannie Lou Hamer, who suffered financial repression. We went on from the frying pan in Louisville and into the fire by moving ourselves to Memphis, Tennessee. Impoverished and plagued by police brutality, it was truly, quote, the city of the blues, which is its slogan. Uh, anybody who knows Memphis knows the deep and rich history of music coming from that town. Living in this majority black city set up a lifetime of learning. Memphis was a marvelous place in terms of music and community spirit and many other ways. Uh, Martha's brother, Mark Allen, joined us there in the movement. 
But Memphis was also deadly. We defended Black Panther Party members during a sit-in where they demanded housing for poor people, and we fought against white police violence. We also helped to organize the Southern Committee to Free Angela Davis and All Political Prisoners, which we organized from our office, offices in Memphis. Um, our offices, by the way, were in our house, uh, which we rented. Um, these are photos of us picketing the federal courthouse as part of a national and international movement to free Angela. And I'll come back to something about these pictures in a minute. Um, you can see Martha there in the in the picket line, uh, and if you look, you'll you'll see me too. Uh, Angela's sister, Fania Davis Jordan, came to speak for the Free Angela movement at Centenary United Methodist Church. This is where I first met James Lawson, who pastored the church and led peace and freedom struggles in Memphis. Of course, we soon ran into trouble with police when we organized a meeting at the home of our friend and neighbor Kathy Roop. Uh, we lived in a um, uh, in a house with two sides where she was on one side and we were in the, on, on the other side. So it was really our house too. Um, police broke in and broke up the meeting. They tried to start a riot. Um, nobody would respond. So then they slugged Kathy's husband and arrested him, uh, claiming that he had assaulted them. Um, after that, a disgruntled police agent in our midst um, blew up Kathy's car with a hand grenade. Uh, he was a military veteran. He had his hands on all kinds of weapons. Tragically, the FBI followed Kathy around for the rest of her life. After she earned an, a PhD in occupational health, the FBI got her blacklisted from federal jobs and ruined her professional life, just as they had done for so many other people. Of course, they didn't do anything about the bombing. We knew we were under constant surveillance by the Memphis police, Red Squad, and the FBI, who worked together hand in glove. They followed us when we handed out leaflets, even when I went to the bank. Uh, they created an 800 page surveillance file on me, on me that begins as a sophomore in college. J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, classified me as he had classified kings and thousands of others as a national security threat who would be put in a de detention camp if the president declared a national emergency. Uh, we ultimately learned that our friend Gene Townsend, the tallest person in this photo, was a police agent. We also learned that Ernest Withers, who photographed most of our activities, and you saw some of his photos above, um, also worked as a paid informant for the FBI for more, more than a dozen years. Uh, we found this and other photos he took of us in our FBI, in my FBI file. We considered him a close friend and ally, but apparently he was not. Our, our national and international campaign ultimately freed Angela. She joined us to organize the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. She never stopped speaking, writing, and organizing. She remains an inspiration today. Her papers are now in the Radcliffe Schlesinger Library. We worked with Angela and the National Alliance to free the Wilmington 10 who were falsely imprisoned for organizing against white supremacist violence in North Carolina. Uh, you see me here in the foreground standing next to their leader, Reverend Ben Chavis, who was an incredible young leader uh, on the courthouse steps in Wilmington, North Carolina. In Memphis, white police continually killed young black men for the most minor of crimes. In the most famous infamous case, 18 white police officers surrounded 16-year-old Elton Hayes and beat him to death. We campaigned for a state law restricting police use of deadly force and fought the police frame-up of five young black men we called the Memphis Five. And you'll see my picture and Martha's picture in there. Um, we also formed a community movement of whites, blacks, liberals, radicals, panthers, communists, socialists to start the Memphis Community Bookstore and Center for Dialogue to spread education and media literacy. Uh, Martha began a women's media campaign monitoring the mass media's racism, sexism, and militarism. Uh, we had both started as uh, college journalists and we both continued using the media like the Bradens had done to fight against oppression. By 1976, I learned that organizers' life is very hard. <clears throat> I, I began to get sick. It seemed like it was killing me. Martha went to work with her mother, Donna Allen, at the Women's Institute for Freedom of the Press in Washington, DC. 
Then Howard University's history department liberated both of us with full scholarships as graduate teaching assistants. <clears throat> and now I'm getting toward the end of what I'm gonna say here. Howard University provided the great privilege of studying black history with black students and professors. I loved living in DC, another majority black community like Memphis and like Detroit where my parents were raised. It was a marvelous place to learn and stay involved politically. I continued working with movement people in DC, shown here in 1907, 1987, with Congressman John Lewis in the center, my great singing partner, David Sawyer on the left and myself on the right. Um, from Howard University, I went on to Northern Illinois University for my PhD to study with labor historians. After that, I combined black history and labor history um, and Martin Luther King studies which I've been doing ever since. Uh, I've continued to teach and preach what I learned in campus labor and community venues, so I don't confine myself to the campus. I feel like this is something that needs to go to the larger public. Uh, but that scholarship that I uh, have accomplished would not exist without those life-changing experiences of the 1960s as a young SDS radical and the 1970s in the Southern Black Freedom Movement. Last thing, um, fellowships at Stanford and elsewhere and a job as a founding faculty at the University of Washington Tacoma uh, made it possible for me to develop a life of teaching, writing, and researching. Um, I'm very proud to have built Tacoma's campus as one of the founding faculty, serving a working class multiracial community. We started with 12 faculty and 143 students in 1990, and now we have 6,000 students and hundreds of faculty today. State schools are fertile grounds for what I like to call the power of remembering. I started a new home life too with music education, Professor Pat Krieger at the University of Puget Sound, as did Martha Allen with Jonathan Zeitlin in DC. We are all grateful to have survived the 60s and 70s with our friendship and love for each other intact. Uh, I remain eternally grateful for the people in my life that have shaped it and given meaning to it. Um, in my current project, I, I want to uh, end with a quote from historian Nancy Bristow, who wrote a book about the 1970 murders of uh, Jackson State Black students in Mississippi by white police. Nancy writes, quote, Americans, and especially those of us who live as white people, uh, must look with open minds and hearts at this nation's history and recognize the role that white supremacy has played in our past. We must become true accomplices, accomplices in the fight for racial justice, which demands that we pursue with humility the knowledge that makes this possible. And last, I want to conclude uh, with a shout out to James Lawson. A lot of people might have been surprised this summer to see this 91-year-old man, uh, despite the pandemic, travel from uh, Los Angeles to Atlanta to give a eulogy for um, uh, uh, for John Lewis. Um, my film, Love and Solidarity, which I hope we can explore sometime this year at, Har Howard, at Harvard. Um, it, here's a brief trailer of that, and then we'll end. <laughs> has always been in ourselves, in our people, and in our unity, in the courage that we have to say no to racism and injustice. The concept of nonviolence is a 20th century term coined by Mohandas Gandhi of India. Gandhi also goes on to say that love is power. It's the most creative power of the universe. And it's the greatest force, he says, that is available to humankind. And humankind needs to learn how to use it. The laborer deserves his wages. I think wages of people who do the work is an essential ingredient of justice and of community. I think the human species was created primarily to learn to work. Physical work, intellectual work, artistic work, community work, social work. We have to work as human beings because it feeds our dignity. 
It feeds our sense of making a contribution. It feeds our sense of taking care of ourselves. And so all work has dignity to it, is what Martin King said. All labor has dignity. And so work is not primarily for wages, but we ought to be able to benefit from our work, especially the work that we do outside of the home and in the larger community. They cannot support the simple right of the ordinary man and woman in this society to have the full dignity of their work and their wages. And we must begin to tell the Democratic Party, stand up and be counted for human rights and for human dignity. The pandemic reminds us we have but one life to live and that we should use that one life well. We must keep on fighting nonviolently for a better world. I give special thanks to the people who have taught and sustained me in and out of academia. Special thanks to the Radcliffe Institute and Harvard for this wonderful opportunity to share and collaborate with humanist scholars and artists who are our fellows. Um, and thank you for people who are listening and watching. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, this was a powerful presentation. We do have time for questions. So um, the first one is, I was struck by your distribution of 50,000 anti-war newspapers. Do you think the ease of internet today has actually undermined some of the best organizing tax tactics involving direct individual contact? And major, any major regrets with hindsight, anything you would do differently? Oh, wow, that second one is really loaded. <laughs> I, I could talk about that one for a long time. Um, I'll talk about the first one. I think that uh, James Lawson emphasizes that there is a method to organizing. It's, it's what unions do, you know, you plan what you're gonna do next, you research what needs to be done, you form a group, you, um, try to sort of train the group. You get people to agree on what your tactics are. You don't just run out in the street uh, as an amorphous group and uh, see what happens. Um, and the internet <laughs> method uh, is great because it turns out many, many more people, but you don't know who the people are and it's not necessarily well organized and anything can happen. And we've seen that in uh, Seattle and Portland all summer long where, we don't even know who the organizers are and and it's really there's nobody really controlling it uh, in the movement so that's a problem uh if you want to win over the public the whole point of demonstrations and mass organizing is to build coalitions with other groups of people so that you have a majority movement that can actually get something done uh and so the it, if we just rely on the internet I'll see you at this corner at this time, but we don't have the training and the backup and the theorizing and the research and the cadre building of a movement, then this is what we get, you know, and it makes us very vulnerable to um, tyrants like uh, William Barr or um, Donald Trump, who then want to use a somewhat chaotic situation and intervene and create chaos. Um, the problems in the summer have, uh, if you look back through them, the New York Times did a good piece on this. Almost all of the violence came when police attacked people. And um, back in the day, we had nonviolent strategies and marshals and so ways to counteract uh, in a mass situation, police violence, and not let it um, change the topic from whatever it is we're fighting for to uh, let's fight the police. And <clears throat> police violence is a horrible problem. I've been seeing that my whole life. So you have to be ready for that and you have to be prepared for that and you have to be organized for that. So um, I know the older hands, older than me, you know, who, who were in the early 60s uh, are saying, you know, it's time for 
people to get to that next organizational level if we really want to win this fight for economic justice. Um, my regrets are more on a personal level that I wish that, um, you know, I could have held family life together better during this. Uh, going to jail, being harassed by the police, staying up all night long, writing press releases, driving across country to this or that campaign doesn't give you the kind of um, time and warmth, you know, that you would like to have in, in personal relationships. And for me, eventually, you know, I, it really made me ill. <laughs> so graduate life was a great relief uh, for me. Going into academia was a great relief. So I do have some regrets, but not so much about the movement and what we did uh, as, as just how it played out for me. Right. Understandably. Um... How did your lifelong activism, especially in the 60s, inform your practices and philosophies of teaching? Have you considered writing a companion uh, young adult book to inspire our next generations? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, a young adult book sounds cool. Um, if I was, one of our fellows does comic books and I was in contact with James Sturm about this. Uh, why don't we make a comic book about nonviolence? You know, teach, teach the basic things of nonviolence in a comic book. Um, people are starved for this. Uh, it's like James Lawson says, when I talk about nonviolence, it's like I'm talking a foreign language to most Americans. It's not a concept that they're familiar with. Um, they don't really know what it means. And some people think nonviolence means passivism or being passive, which is not what it means at all. So uh, yes, that would be, I think, good to find a way to reach younger people with these issues. Uh, the way it informs my teaching is one, what, what do I teach? I teach labor and civil rights and King studies. Uh, as part of that, I also teach oral history. Um, the reason I've been able to recover so much of these stories uh, of black workers and white workers in the South is because I had lived in Memphis I had a lot of contacts. I knew people uh, in graduate school. I started going back to Memphis and um, recording. I probably did 100 interviews with black and white workers in the South. And so, you know, I go on the Howard Zinn kind of framework of history from the bottom up. And in the time period that I'm writing about, a lot of those people were still alive. Most of them are dead now. But at the time I was doing my research, a lot of them were alive. So I teach students that this is something you can do now, today. So last spring, uh, my oral history class, we started interviewing people who were essential workers, doctors, other people, um, service workers, about life in the pandemic, uh, working class life in the pandemic. And someday that'll be a historical record. Uh, and so, you know, my method continues to be like bottom up. Um, trying to find out through documents, through uh, interviews, and now in my, I'm experimenting through my own kind of interviewing myself, um, trying to find ways to humanize history and make it something that people can imagine that it's part of them, that they're, they are part of history. It's um, like Faulkner said, the past is not dead. It's not even past, it's part of us. So this is the strategy I'm using in my writing, but also in my teaching. Yeah, great. Um, have the unions reached out, joined, and supported the Black Lives Matter uprising? And what do you think are the uh, under-examined areas of inquiries in the study of Black liberation movements? Ah, uh, yes, unions have many unions have come out strongly in support of Black Lives Matter. Uh, on the West Coast where I live, um, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union did a sh shutting down the ports in uh, San Francisco and Oakland as a protest against police violence. I forget at which point that happened this summer. Um, other unions have um, not only just made resolutions, but put people out in the streets to support the Black Lives Matter campaigns. 
Uh, and also right now uh, where I live, uh, Washington State Labor Council and the Martin Luther King Labor Council in, in Martin Luther King County, which is Seattle, um, they've passed resolutions that if Trump tries to overthrow the elections that they will start a general strike of the labor movement. So unions are, are very involved, not all of them, but a lot of them are very involved. Um, what was the second part, Claudia? The second was, uh, what do you think are uh, some under-examined areas of inquiries in the study of black liberation movements? Ah, okay. Wow, just about everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, we kind we kind of think you know the 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 part of uh, the historians that I'm part of were post 1960s. So I I started you know graduate school in 1976. Um, the history of the Black Freedom Movement, um, except that was done by Black scholars, people like Du Bois and many many others uh, Black scholars who wrote during that time. Um, but a lot of writing was, it was all about, quote, the civil rights movement, which is sort of a narrow framework. Um, so we started looking at what we called social history, which again is this history from the bottom up. What were ordinary people doing? And there's a, there's a wonderful history now of the Black Freedom Movement from all levels. Um, um, I think of this book recently, Black Against Empire, about the Black Panther Party. It's just a phenomenal book. Uh, but there is so much more to be explored in terms of the different aspects of the Black Freedom Movement, which is intellectual, social, economic, labor. My framework has been really to focus on labor, especially. Um, and I think actually, you know, there's been so many studies of King, but we're only now starting to get people to really focus in on what was King really talking about, which, you know, was very radical. Um, uh, basically remaking American capitalism or replacing it with something better. And I think that um, there's lots of room for people to, it, it may seem like there's so many studies now, which there are, but it's, it's building a framework for all kinds of other studies. Yeah. Um, there is a question now on uh, oral histories. Uh, and the question is, um, how do you move uh, from self story to our collective story? And then what approaches and strategies uh, you use to get people committed to action, to commit to action? Hmm. Um, those are two really different things. So say the first part again. Yes, how do you move from self story to our collective story? Well, that's what I'm struggling with right now. Um, I haven't written self story before. Um, and the reason I'm doing it is because over the years, people have told me the, the reason I got involved in this kind of research was through my own experience in Memphis and Louisville and across the South. That got me interested in the topics that got me connected to the people. I knew a lot of the great people um, who were in the movement before me. Um, James, James Loss and Fred Shuttlesworth, John Lewis, the list goes on, Betty Mae Fikes, um, Highlander Folk School. So I, my self story really motivated the history writing of which ended up with six books. This is the first time I'm actually trying to see how do you connect self story to the larger story? And it's uncomfortable. I find it uncomfortable because I don't want it to be about me. Uh, that's not why I'm writing it. That's not what it's about. Um, it's trying to see history through the eyes of someone who was there. But like I said in my introduction, memory is not history. And I've discovered so many times that the way I remember things is not accurate. I conflate things. I put them in the wrong year, or the wrong order. Um, maybe I even have the whole idea of what happened wrong. So I'm approaching it really as a historian to, to actually research what happened. The FBI files are marvelous help because they often tell me things that I did that I've completely forgotten about now. Um, like uh, Casey Wagner, my research assistant in Tacoma, went through all these files and uh, he found things like um, 
oh, I organized a community meeting against police brutality and we invited the police chief and he and I debated police brutality in front of an audience in a housing project. I didn't remember that at all, but it sounds right. <laughs> it sounds like something I would have done and, and was doing. And I kind of remember it, but um, my uh, partner, Martha Allen, was very good about writing down day-to-day -day things that happened. So I've been relying a lot on her diaries of, you know, well, this was the day we did this. So connecting the personal to the larger story, I'm finding is quite challenging. And also a lot of times I'm, I'm wanting to go off on tangents, like, you know, to tell the whole story of the Vietnam War, um, which then breaks up the storyline uh, that I'm trying to tell of, of, you know, me going through these time periods. So it's really, it's really tricky. Um, and so I, I wouldn't give anybody advice <laughs> at this point <laughs> until I, I really know what I'm doing. Uh, was the second part about organizing today? What yes, I needed it out to you. Um, and then what approaches and strategies do you use to get people to commit to action? Uh, well, you know, as a teacher, which I, I'm, I'm no longer, I've finally accepted I'm no longer an organizer. I'm a teacher and a scholar. Um, so I try to use history and understanding of things to motivate people. And then it's up to them, really, to decide how to organize, what they should do. Uh, back when I was an organizer, it was finding people who seemed really concerned about an issue, um, building an organization of some kind with other people who had that same concern, and then trying to find more such people, and then planning some goals that we were gonna fight for, like uh, back in those times, trying to pass a law against police use of deadly force. And so of course I went to the American Civil Liberties Union and they got involved and so, you know, it takes into account, there are organizations, we're not alone, there are other people out there who are organized. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you try to plug people into that. And if there is no organization, for instance, Angela Davis, there was nothing. So we built a committee to free Angela Davis in Memphis, and we did that all over the country. And then we changed it to committee to free all political prisoners. So um, the only thing I could say about now is that if people are highly aware of an issue that they want to do something about, it's not enough to protest. You have to organize. Protests come and go. Organization is required to really win some battles. And King was really clear about this. King did not develop uh, protests for the sake of protest. It always had a goal. And this is how we got the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And it's always good to think of it this way. People won't sacrifice their lives and go out on the front lines over and over again if they don't get some victories. Mm -hmm. and, and so we need to you know, have that part of the plan and we need to figure out what are the victories and you don't get everything that you want. You have to get something though or people won't keep going. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. This is all we have time for today. So thank you uh, for your thoughtful presentation and your perspectives. Um, I also want to thank you, our audience, uh, for the terrific questions. I hope you'll be able to join us for other RACLID virtual programs. You can find out about future programs and watch videos of past events at raclid.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and have a good rest of the day.